the way it started, I'm if there's a vice I've got, and you'd probably see it if you came in my house is, you know, a baseball card collector, football card collector, you know, and, you know, I've got all these cards from wherever it was. And, and in the late 80s, that was a big thing again, you know, and all these card companies were coming out. So we decided we would do a card show at the Super Bowl. And we did it in New Orleans in 1990. And we built a tent on the deck, the parking deck at the Superdome. Because my, my thought was, you know, if you're going to sell a Mickey Mantle rookie card or whatever it was, which probably in those days was all of five or $6,000, who else had that disposable money than people who came to the Super Bowl? Well, we were shocked. We had 40,000 people come through that card show. And so I said, I think, I think we've got something here that's really kind of unique. So the next year we came back and we came up with this idea of NFL Town Square, which was, I guess, based on the concept that it's kind of like a uh, mall and the card show would be an anchor store and we'd make a merchandise store as an anchor store. And we would have an NFL film studios, the movie theater and fill it in with other things there. I think our total budget to do it was two hundred seventy five thousand dollars. And we drew and, and I kind of lied about it. Um, I told Tagley Boo that Roselle had approved it <laughs> when he, he hadn't. <laughs> But that was when the transition from Tagley Boo, from Tagley Boo to from Roselle to Tagley Boo, but we had seventy three thousand people come to it, you know. And, and now the thing draws a quarter of a million people, you know. And it's it's place to be. And like I said, it's all it started with the card show concept that was there. And uh, I think the idea was the seventy three thousand people that went the first year in Tampa, you know. Ironically, that was the one with the Iraq war and all that. But I'm going to tell you, 75% of them were locals that wanted to come down and be part of the game. Well, I think you know, that's maybe, it. The, the experience lets everybody get close to the game and still yeah. gives you the feel that you're there, even though you'll never get inside the stadium. I mean, to me, that's that's brilliant. And as I'm looking at all the other championship events here, Jim, there's no doubt that the NFL changed championship events and change the way everybody puts together the event. And is it not fair to say that were it not for the Super Bowl and you and the NFL experience and all the things that you brought into here, it, it'd be a little less for a lot of these events, because as you said earlier, they just copy off you. And that's all they have to, they, they watched and watched you succeed. You have the Super Bowl evolved all these championship events into becoming the NBA weekend, the NHL all-star weekend. They all saw the, 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 the need and the dollars you could make by doing these things. Well, you know, you said that one of the great ironies is that uh, the woman, Sue Robichek was the woman I put in charge of, of handling, you know, the first town square. And she was dating the guy who was the special events guy with baseball. And ironically, within a year, <laughs> baseball, had, baseball had their own version of it. So, I mean, yeah, I, I, there's nothing wrong with stealing and adapting those things. And, you know, I've seen them at the final fours and it's tougher to do, I think, with, uh, uh, you know, the World Series and, and Stanley Cup NBA finals. But I do think at the at, certainly you're seeing at final fours and you're seeing at the NBA All-Star Game or MLB All-Star Game or those type of things that you can plan ahead to make it happen. And, uh, yeah, I think that it's Kudos to us for being for thinking a little bit ahead of it and trying to get there. And they said that somebody asked me once, you know, who who's your audience? And, and I said, well, for us, America, we wanted to do the world, well, we, wanted, we wanted to do something where the team saw things that they could turn around and use themselves. We wanted to show the other leagues that we were doing stuff <laughs> that they weren't doing and we were doing it and they could copy us. So, you know, that was kind of it was a little there and, and all the people that were in the I guess I call it the event group <laughs> between all the other sports, you know, hockey, basketball, you know, NCAA, whatever it is. We all talked, <laughs> you know, got no problem about what's going on. And, and we've got similar circumstances. So, you know, how you adapt to it. And, you know, after Super Bowl 36, when we did I, one of the great funny, well, funny story from Super Bowl 25 was, if you remember right, everybody was afraid of the, uh, that the Iraqis had some sort of um, chemical that they were gonna unleash. So we went out and bought all the available antidote <laughs> to that 
chemical that we could find. And we had it stored underneath the stadium and we had a plan of how we would distribute it. You know, we, I think we only, unfortunately, we probably only had like 10,000 doses and we would have needed 70,000. But we sold that off to the NBA <laughs> for the NBA All-Star game. And I think they sold it off to the NCAA for the Final Four. I don't know who ended up with it last, but uh, it was ours that we originally bought. So, you know, there was no harm in doing that. With regard to that and where we are now in, in world society at this point and all the protections that are being taken for people when they go to even the smallest events, what you just mentioned is something that very few people would know and they would be shocked to hear. But is it not fair to say that there are, there are you could fill volumes with the amount of security responsibilities mm -hmm. that this brings up? Because as you put more events into it and brought more people, then I have to believe as things ratcheted up and we became a different society, especially after 2001, that the fans are unaware of the, the immense amount of money and time that has to be spent. Well, and that's what you want to do. That extra security. Yeah, I, I'll give you a funny story from Super Bowl 36, you know, the one after 9-11. All the, and if you remember right, after going through everything, you know, with 9-11, we had an anthrax scare yep. you know, that November. So there was a concern we had, and I remember we had one of those things called a tabletop exercise, where you bring in all the people from wherever it is, police, fire, CDC, or whatever, and you go through, here's the scenario, you know, how are you going to respond to the scenario? So the scenario is we've had an anthrax outbreak, you know, in section 136, what do we do, and all these things. So they start turning around, and they said, okay, well, you know, we, we'd isolate that area, you know, we take those people and, and spread everybody else away from it. Uh, then we'd have to take everybody out of the building and we'd have to wash them down. I said, what do you mean? He says, well, they'd have to take all their clothes off and we'd have to wash them all down with water. I said, everybody's going to take their clothes off and we're going to wash them down with water? He said, yeah. And then I thought for a second, well, we are in New Orleans, so it's not that big a deal. No, no, no. That's a terrible scene. I can't even, I don't think I'll ever get rid of that, that visual in my head now. <laughs> but, if you, but if you ever watch, if you ever look at a broad look over that stadium, outside of the stadium on game day. There are giant trucks out there full of water, <laughs> just in case we had to do that. So yeah, it's kind of preparing for every eventuality you could have. What's the story, you know, as I said, you've got a million stories that you've never told. So here's your chance. You've, you've told so many, but is there one sitting in the back of your mind that from everything that you did and from all the, the, the machinations and all the trials and tribulations you went through that still speaks to you as a, as a special moment, a fun moment, but something that you've never told before? Oh boy. I, it's a tough question because I'm not really sure where I go with that. Um, <laughs> that's and, why I get paid I, the small money, Jim. It's just, yeah, that's, that you know, I, you know, each one of these games, I, I, I'll give you one and I've told this one before and people have written it, but I think it's, worth noting because it, it has to do with Tampa and, and that game, you know, Super Bowl 25. Um, in those days, we did not resod, resod the field. We reseeded it. And so after the bowl game, we came in and reseeded the, the entire field. And we didn't have a lot of sun. Uh, sorry to say, Florida, we didn't have a lot of sun in January. And so it didn't grow. And we came in and we painted it afterwards. And we brought, you know, the Bills and the Giants came in to practice on it on Saturday. And the middle of the field where the logo was, was tearing up. And George Toma comes to me, you know, about two o'clock in the afternoon. And he says, listen, we got a real problem. Um, the field's not holding, we got to replace it. I said, what? He said, yeah, we got to replace the middle of the field between the 35 yard lines. And I'm kind of like, really? How are you going to do this? So he said, don't worry, I'll take care of it. So what he did was he came in and took out basically where the logo was at midfield, went over to the University of Tampa and stole the sod out of their soccer stadium or soccer field and came in and had it all planted, had it all painted, everything down on Sunday morning, and nobody knew the difference that he Are did. Are you using that. stole as a euphemism here or realistically steal? 
We were listening. Well, I don't think we, he has permission. <laughs> George, we were using look, George is the guy who's taking care of fields at the Super Bowl for God knows how long. I can't imagine yeah. that anybody asks him, George, do whatever you want. You know, I he's know. Got that kind well, of- I just, I somehow I envision the athletic director of the University of Tampa or walking in on Monday morning, looking down his field and going, where the hell is it? You know, but obviously, <laughs> we, obviously we replaced it, but you know, uh, that would be kind of a shock <laughs> to see what had taken place. But yeah, I mean, there, there's all sorts of things that have taken place and, uh, you know, entertainers that we've gone back and forth with and doing different things. And, um, you know, for the entertainers, it's always something that most of them don't understand the stage they're on. Oh, yeah, I've played 50,000 people in a stadium before, no big deal. And then you get out there and all of a sudden you realize there's 80,000 people and there's 110 million people watching it. Uh, it's not as easy as you thought it was. Was there ever um, a performer you had to push out there? You had to say, go ahead. You're, you're on. You're on. Damn it. No matter what happens, you're on. No, uh, I did. I, there was one that uh, say, that sang it live that his father was standing about 10 feet away from him and mouthing the words to him so he wouldn't forget him. <laughs> Um, but no, we've been pretty fortunate. We were pretty fortunate with that. Look at my mind. If you can score a Prince every year, if you're, you're, you're a Prince or a Springsteen, you're good for me. I mean, I'm well, when, when, when Michael did, when Michael Jackson did it, uh, you know, he, one of the things that happened that we argued with him and he wouldn't pay attention to us. We said, well, you know, he's used to coming out on stage and standing there for two minutes and the crowd going nuts. And he said he wanted to, and in this one, you know, he, he jumped out of the middle of the stage and he stood there for like a minute and 15 seconds, didn't move. And we kept telling him, nobody's going to respond to you. <laughs> and the shots, if you look at the shots that they have on the network feed, there are people sitting there like this going, what's going on, you know? And then he finally started, I think that the key was he had to touch the cap at the top of his cap for the music. So I think the first song was Billie Jean. And uh, so he had to do that to get it started. But yeah, he didn't understand it, but he got it after he got there and he looked around and saw nobody was responding to him at all. 